Welcome to the Libertarian Guide to North Korea. Uh, my name is Michael Malice. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, my day job is I co-author books for celebrities. I've worked with D.L. Hughley, Ultimate Fighting Champion Matt Hughes, uh, a couple of others. And a friend of mine said, hey, you should do the autobiography of Kim Jong-il. And I'm like, okay, this would be a fun project. And the more I learned about Kim Jong-il and North Korea, the more I realized North Korea isn't a joke. And it's really important for us to know about what's going on over there. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for us. And here's why. If we move the needle even a little bit in the States, you know, the marginal change is going to be pretty minor. But if we move the needle even a little bit in North Korea, it's the least free state on earth. Uh, really positive things can happen really quickly. And it's also a major teaching tool. There's a very famous picture of the Korean Peninsula at night, and you can see North Korea versus South Korea, and South Korea is all lit up, and North Korea is all black. Uh, there's that old joke, what did the socialists use before they used uh, candles, light bulbs? Uh, and North Korea is kind of proof of that. And if you read any article about uh, North Korea, 90% of the time the people will not have any idea what they're talking about. Because uh, they don't know the history, it's a completely foreign culture, a completely alien culture and, and mentality. Uh, and it takes a lot of deciphering, uh, which you know, hopefully I'm going to be doing with my forthcoming book. So let me give you briefly the history where things stand now, what it's like to visit there, so on and so forth. Um, the Korean Peninsula is bordered by China on the west. They've got a big river border. It's got a little bit with Russia um, on the north. It's been a very, very insular country for a very long time. In fact, I was just in town two days ago, and there's an antique store, and there was a book from 1895 about a guy traveling to Japan, China, and Korea. Korea was spelled with a C. And even there, they refer to it as the Hermit king Kingdom. In the 1860s, the U.S. sent a ship to Korea. Uh, it was just one country then. It's always been Korea, the Korean Peninsula. And all the people on board were burned alive and killed because it was illegal for any foreigner to enter Korea up to like the late 1900s. Uh, in the late 1900s, the Japanese, uh, who, you know, th their empire, uh, they got their foot into Korea, and Japan and China and Russia were fighting over the land. Uh, and of course, the Korean people kind of got the butt of it, and it did not end well for them. Uh, they took the Korean queen, where she was hiding her bedroom, slashed her up with swords, set her on fire alive, and then threw her in a, in a pond. This is in 1895. And it's, it's really scary is... Uh, the parallels between Korea and Iraq are really strong because Japan said, hey, we're driving the Chinese and the Russians out of here. We're going to stay here. We're going to protect you. And they didn't leave, right? Uh, and they really kind of, in a sense, uh, at first figuratively made Korea their own colony, and then literally Korea became a colony of Japan. Now, if you read the Korean propaganda, it's the worst thing ever. Blah, blah, blah. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as they say, but it wasn't nice. Because remember, these are the Japanese, these are the people who sat down with Hitler and said, you know what, buddy, I like what you're saying, I like how you're saying it, let's be best friends, right? Uh, so those wounds from the Japanese colonization are still very, very much a part of the consciousness um, in all of Korea. In fact, when I was in Pyongyang, what I realized to do is, if you take any racist joke and you just replace the punchline with Japanese, everyone in North Korea will think you're hysterical. How do you stop a Japanese man from drowning? Take your foot off his neck. What do you call a thousand Japanese to bomb the ocean? A good start. They were crying laughing. <laughs> and and the, the fact that you, know, you have these North Koreans laughing is again something foreign to our thinking because we're so used to this idea that they're all brainwashed robots uh, and they're just going to kill for Kim Jong-il and, and we gotta worry and that's really not the case. So, uh, Come 1905, you know, Korea becomes a Japanese colony again. It's only one country of Korea. It's not divided yet. Um, and then Kim Il-sung is born in 1912. Kim Il-sung is Kim Jong-il's father. No one here really knows who Kim Il-sung is, but he is a thousand times more important to Korean history than Kim Jong-il. In fact, I met a refugee, and the fact that pe everyone knows... I don't like refugees either, but, you know, they got to go somewhere. <laughs> Huh. I, I met a refugee, and, and, the, 
And the fact that everyone here knows who Kim Jong Il is, and no one knows who Kim Il Sung, she literally can't even wrap her head around it at this point. It would be like someone telling you, "I love Gerald Ford. I love Gerald Ford. I love Gerald Ford." And you're like, "Well, what about Nixon? Who?" Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. You can't have the second without the first. But that's kind of how the media has put it in, in this country. So Kim Il Sung is, you know, born in 1912. Uh, he starts this guerrilla group uh, to fight the Japanese under the auspices of the Soviets. <laughs> And and the thing about when you're talking about North Korean history is they live in a complete parallel universe. So I'm going to be telling you the real history, but their propaganda is not in touch with reality. But it parallels what's really happening. So it's kind of hard to keep track of what's real and what they perceive. And the other thing is, once you start a lie in propaganda, you really have to build on it. So they've just been getting further and further removed from reality. So I'm, I'm going to tell the real history, then I'll tell you their version of history. So Kim Il Sung is fighting under the Russians. World War II comes. Uh, you know the Japanese are defeated, of course, and the Koreans have a point because Korea, after World War II, is treated like conquered territory, even though Korea never fought the Allies. You know the U.S. and the Soviet Union basically decide to divide it up. One of the generals on the U.S. side had to look at a map to know where Korea was because it was such an insignificant place, and they took out a map and they're like, "Where are we going to divide? You know, who governs what part of the peninsula? Because neither neither side, the Russians or the U.S., had enough forces to govern the whole thing, and both wanted their footprint there, right? So they just drew a line, you know, basically across the country. Uh, the U.S. wanted to have Seoul, so it was just north of Seoul." And the Russians like, sure, we don't care. You know, they really could not care less about Korea because they're more worried about Eastern Europe, um, and and you know, and and helping Mao and China. Uh, so Kim Il Sung uh, declares himself the president of all of Korea, and the U.S. representative who they appointed, uh, Syng Min Rhee, declares himself the president of all of Korea. So you have two dueling governments on this one peninsula. You have this line across the middle where, like, the Russians are kind of in charge on top, and the Americans are kind of in charge on the bottom, and both sides start persecuting people that they don't like, right? So in the north, all the people who were like Christians, and Pyongyang was known as the Jerusalem of the East. All the people who had money, who were landlords, they all fled south. And all the rabble rousers and people who believed in communism and things like that—they all fled north. So this nation kind of self-segregated, and things started to get more and more kind of violent because who is going to be the authority governing Korea, right? So there's re been recently a, a documentation revealed behind the scenes. So Kim Il Sung is is basically Stalin's bitch, and he's like, I want to conquer South Korea. I want to conquer South Korea, and Stalin's like, No. He's like, I want to conquer. He stamp. It, the writer described it as him stamping his feet. And eventually, Stalin's like, "All right, just just go, you know, take over." So he, in 1950, he launches a surprise attack on southern Korea. It's still Korea with one, just one country. Uh, and with within three days, he's in Seoul, and very brief, in very very quickly, he he has control of 95 percent of the Korean Peninsula. Douglas MacArthur is like, "We're not going to have this." Uh, he lands with a huge slew of troops at Incheon, including some UN people from many different countries. He fights back, and then very quickly, the U.S. Ha itself has 90% of the peninsula, pushing everyone north. Then China comes in as backup, and basically in 1953, after the Korean War ends, it's back where it started, divided along the 38th parallel. But you know, we always talk about how you know, as libertarians, we talk about how bad war is and then devastating effects. And you look at Iraq and and places like that when you have one superpower, you know, fighting a weak country and what effect that has on the people. Well, imagine what happens when you have two superpowers, well, three: Russia, China, and the U.S. fighting over one little country. What that does to those people. So Korea was completely, completely decimated. Uh, there was what's well, you can even see what it looks like right here because there was a European reporter who talks about he went to one town and he didn't know why, but all that were left were the chimneys. Everything it was there's so much carpet bombing that all the buildings were destroyed and all you had standing were the chimneys, just miles of them. And it, if you look, what, what's that building, Mike? Uh, the, the bingo hall. If you look up there, just the chimney is standing after it was uh, burnt down. So you can see a little piece of North Korea for yourself. Now this really, really. You know, so many people died.、Uh, of course, the Koreans blame us for every kind of brutality. They claim we released insects with disease in them to give them, you know, diseases. And at first, you're like, okay, they're crazy. And then just this week, I realized, you know, we we 
did that to the Indians, uh, you know, gave them smallpox. And, and President Truman in 1950 publicly mused about, well, you know, nukes are on the table, we're considering using them. So if, if you have a president who's publicly talking about nuking a country, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't put anything kind of past them. And this effectively marked the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, so come 1953, you know, Kim Il-sung's um, in charge in the North, and he's really very much a vassal of the Soviet Union. But come 1956, you know, Khrushchev now is in charge in Russia. And what Khrushchev starts doing is throwing Stalin under the bus. Stalin was cruel, Stalin did all these atrocities, we're the kinder, happier Soviet Union, and many of the Soviet satellite states followed suit. And there was a coup attempt at this, you know, common turn meeting against Kim Il-sung, and he put it down completely. And this was a major turning point because now North Korea became its own independent thing, and it ceased to start looking like the other communist countries and became this weird hybrid of communism and fascism. Because come 1956, he's in complete control, and they start building the personality cult around Kim Il-sung. He's this great, and they start burning all the books. You're not allowed to have any foreign books. And he starts putting forth his Juche philosophy. Now, the word Juche for North Korea is like Smurf. Uh, it can be a noun, it could be a verb. It has no real meaning, and it means everything. So ostensibly, Juche means self-reliance, but they also have Juche architecture and Juche magic, and meaning magicians, Juche acrobatics, uh, you know, Juche literature. It's applying Juche to these different fields. But applying self-reliance to the field of literature does not really mean anything, if you think about it. Um, and they claim that everything that they do is original to Korea. Uh, the, uh, some of the claims include that Korean was one of the first spoken languages. Uh, 5,000 years ago, Korea was the first government on Earth. Uh, the Korean people have been pure for 5,000 years. And, and it, there's a point to that. Korea, North Korea is the most homogenous country on Earth. Um, and there's very much this Nazi element of pure blood. And they always talk about the blood and keeping the blood pure. Uh, and one of the big attacks they have on South Korea to this day is that the South Korean women are mating with these disgusting American soldiers and foreigners. And it's just abs and we're keeping Korea pure. And if you think about it, and I'm amazed that not one article on North Korea talks about this, the distinction between the leader and the Fuhrer is really nothing. Um, you know, everyone is taught to live for the leader. You know, as children, they're taught to be you know, bombs for Kim Il-sung um, from a very, very early age. Uh, now, he starts to go in a completely uh, off the charts crazy direction because Kim Il-sung has to decide, now that I'm in complete control, who in the population can I rely on and who do I not rely on? So, and this sounds absurd and this is not propaganda, they actually did this. They took half files on every single person, and they did this in 1962, and they said, what was your family doing during the Korean War? And you are thereby divided into a caste system. There's three major castes, loyal, wavering, or hostile, and they're subdivided to 51 subcastes. So if you were a landlord, you're hostile. If you, you know, sided with the Americans at all, you're, if you were born in Seoul, you're, you're wavering at best. They don't tell you what caste you are, and what caste you are determines if you go to college if you couldn't join the army, if you could get a good job, and it determines where you live. So he took all the people who have the negative caste and moved them to the Northeast, and to live in Pyongyang, you have to have a positive family background. And you can kind of, I met this refugee, and, and I'm like, how do you know what your caste is? They don't tell you. She's like, you can kind of deduce it. If you went to college, you come from good breeding, and if you're kind of, you know, living in the Northeast, you know, this person's a bad breeding. You're, only, you're not allowed to go wherever you want North Korea. You have to stay put. You have to get a dispensation to move to another city. And it sounds completely crazy, but there's a point of sanity to, or parallel to us that we have too, because you can talk about someone, you know, their family has, you know, comes from money, or someone, you say someone's white trash. It's, it's the exact parallel, but they're forcing it based only on what your family was doing in 1958. And this determines marriages and dating and, and you know, all sorts of things. The term is Shungbun. He also starts uh, putting together concentration camps. And the concentration camps, again, dealing with purifying the blood. If you go to the camps, they take three generations of your family. Uh, so one of the big things against people escaping North Korea is if you get out, 
whoever's left is going to the camps. And these camps are still there. You can see them on Google Earth. Uh, they're getting bigger. The North Koreans do not know that you're going to a camp, but they do know that sometimes people vanish in the middle of the night. And they think that's a good thing because those people are troublemakers. So let me talk about what life in these camps are like. They're, as of now, they have, they're run out of rats because that's what the people were eating. You have no food. The kids still go to school, uh, but it's the kind of thing where if you're caught with grains of corn in your pocket, you're beaten to death in front of the class to give them a lesson. Uh, if you're really bad, you get sent to the mines where you li literally do not leave the mine ever while you're alive. And because of vitamin D deficiency, their skin starts to fall off and they get all sorts of boils and other funny stuff. Uh, the people are given meager amounts of corn. But as you know, if you know from reading John's book, uh, if you don't have, what is it, sodium, uh, if you, corn is very hard to digest, and these people are seeing incidences of pellagra, a disease that you know, is pretty much unknown to the West at this point. Um, another thing they do to make sure everyone is under control is they have weekly criticism and self-criticism sessions. You have this since you're a kid. They've been doing this for 50 years. It's like AA. On Sunday, everyone gets together. You start out with a praise to the leader. Then you have to get up and say, what you did wrong that week in front of all the people in your neighborhood. I was late to class. I didn't do homework. I didn't paint the picture. I didn't dust the picture of Kim Il-sung in my house. And then everyone else chastises you. And you're also encouraged to rat out people you've seen misbehaving to your neighbors as well. Uh, so it's a completely surveillance society you're very much encouraged to turn in your neighbors. And in fact, every neighborhood, there's a middle-aged woman in charge of it, and she kind of has to know, the, the joke is she knows how many forks in every person's house. If someone's staying over, if, if someone's visiting, like everyone has to explain everything to everyone else. Um, so come the, the 50s and 60s, with great help from Russia, and then later China, Kim Il-sung is playing them against each other. North Korea is actually uh, economically doing well. It industrializes. Uh, and South Korea at this point is this kind of like agricultural backwater because South Korea's leadership is one, you know, kind of basically quasi-dictator after another. I mean, we think about South Korea since it's a U.S. ally as being, you know, kind of democratic and free, but for a long time, things happened like the first lady was assassinated, the head of the South Korean CIA killed the president, and he became the president. So there was a lot of... <laughs> Right, so it's like we don't hear about this stuff because they're U.S. allies, so only nice things happen, but we hear a lot about what the U.S. enemies are doing um, in the press. Um, now, come the 80s, uh, the question is, who's going to take over when Kim Il-sung dies? Now, there's statues built to Kim Il-sung, you know, all of the, like, schoolwork, they had to, they, there's this story that Kim Il-sung walked from China to Korea 250 miles. Like, the kids on a test have to be like, what towns did he stop in? All of the education is basically based around uh, you know, Kim Il-sung and his activities. And the question is, who's going to take over when Kim Il-sung dies? And there was this big kind of power struggle behind the scenes between Kim Il-sung and, and his son Kim Jong-il, between Kim Il-sung's brother and some Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-il won out. Now, Kim Jong-il's background before he got chosen as successor was to remake all of Korean art in the Juche way. What does that mean? Well, all the art has to be about Kim Il-sung. It has to be about the anti-Japanese struggle, uh, how Korea is great, how the rest of the world's terrible. And these people have no you know, access to the outside world to kind of have any information about what's good or what's bad. But the thing is, they don't really care because they're not, you know, there's food on the table, they have a house, you know, they have their family and friends. It's not, you know, what it can be. Come 1988, Seoul is awarded the Olympics. And this is a major point in North-South Korean relations, if you could believe it, because Kim Jong-il is like, hey, why don't we co-host the Olympics, not understanding that the Olympics are given to a city and not to a country. Uh, Seoul is like, no, we're not going to do this. You know, our countries have been, been divided for a long time and it just doesn't make sense. So, Kim Jong-il sends an agent to blow up a South Korean airliner. The plane blows up, hundreds of people die. The agents are caught in Bahrain, and in James Bond fashion, they start smoking cyanide-laced cigarettes. The guy dies, the woman lives, she's taken to South Korea, and she's pardoned by the president of South Korea because she was brainwashed 
by uh, <laughs> the North, supposedly. So it's kind of like if Obama, you know, uh, pardoned Jared Lochner because, you know, the Tea Party made you do it, so it's, it's fine. And she's living in South Korea under guard, you know, to, to be kept safe. So it's, it's really kind of wacky over there on uh, both sides, but certainly more in the North. Now let me tell you a bit about what the Northern uh, propaganda looks like. According to the Northern propaganda, you know, Kim Il-sung is born in 1912. Uh, he, you know, as a child, he left his home village and he said, I'm not going to come back here until Korea is free. He's fighting in Manchuria, which is northeast China, with you know, all his guerrillas. He literally walks across water uh, to cross back. And I asked this guy there, because there's this thing about he, he leaves to cross the, the river. I'm like, oh, is this kind of like a metaphor? Like he wove a raft. She goes, no, 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 he literally walked across water. And, and you know, he pretty much, according to propaganda, single-handedly drove the wicked Japs or the Jap bastards you know, out, of, out of Korea. They always use the term, Jap bastard or U.S. imperialist bastard, it's never American. It's always both together, just to get it in your head that, you know, we're the devil. He, according to the, to the propaganda, he drives the Japanese out of Korea. Uh, he's the greatest man ever. Uh, he's just so smart and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's single-handedly, you know, building this great Juche country. So when Kim, Kim Jong-il starts taking over in the 80s, he's taking over in the back. Kim Il-sung is pretty much a figurehead. And Kim Il-sung dies in... Uh, 1994, and Kim Jong-il takes over officially. Now here's where things get really crazy, because Kim Il-sung dies, there's huge weather problems in North Korea, there's flooding, and all their reserves of food are underground, so, that, so not only are the farms all destroyed, all the reserves are destroyed, right? Kim Jong-il is having a nuclear program, there's sanctions against them, you know, from the US, so food becomes a major problem as soon as Kim Jong-il takes over. Um, so, and people are aware of this. The line I always say is, it's very easy to convince a nation that you have it great and that other countries envy you. It's very, very hard to convince a nation that you have more food on your plate this year than you did last year. You don't need to have, you know, you just need to see. And, it's, and all this propaganda that we joke about with Kim Jong-il in this country, serves a very rational and real purpose. Because again, Kim Il-sung is this military leader, he drove the Japanese out, he built this country, and when he was in charge, things were good, and his son, Kim Jong-il, is this fat nerd, and as soon as he takes over, everyone's starving, so this propaganda is trying to put across this idea that Kim Jong-il is as good as his father. And in fact, and this sounds like a joke and it's not, Kim Jong-il's campaign slogan when he took over was, do not expect any change from me. Uh, I am the same as my father. I was, <laughs> I was talking to this refugee and I'm like, how much of this stuff do you... The, were people actually believing? And, and the point I realized is if you're going to brainwash Asian people, you should not use math as your mechanism. There's a very, here's, there's a very famous story about Kim Jong-il's in kindergarten, and there's a plant, and the teacher goes, one plus one is two. And he thinks of a, of a leaf on a plant, and he goes, no, sometimes I see a drop of water, and this leaf, and then another drop adds to it, and you get one big drop. So sometimes one and one is one, therefore communism, right? And this refugee is in first grade, and she's like, this is fucking ridiculous. What the? <laughs> what? So there is, there is a huge amount of skepticism towards the Kim Jong-il regime after Kim Il-sung died. And like I said earlier, like all these refugees still revere Kim Il-sung as their uh, kind of George Washington figure, somewhat with good reason. And a lot of these stories about Kim Il-sung, well, we have these stories about, you know, George Washington and the cherry tree, which we know aren't literally true, but are kind of examples to show his character. So, you know, their perspective on Kim Il-sung, though not based in reality, is, is not as crazy as some people would perceive. Uh, Kim Jong-il's philosophy becomes Shangun, which means military first, which means the military eats first. So all the food, all the resources are being allocated towards the military. A lot of this money is being built, is, is, instead of being spent on food for people, is being spent on these huge you know, monuments. And there's this funny story, which I love. They, they have something called, they have an Arc de Triomphe in Pyongyang, which looks exactly like the one in France, 
but it's like a meter taller and therefore better, right? But they will tell you it's not based on the French one, it's based on ancient Korean architecture. So everything they have is supposedly based in Korea. They have the tallest stone tower on earth, which just looks like the Washington Monument. And if you read the literature, the architects were like, we're going to make it, you know, 100 sto feet tall. And Kim Jong-il's like, no, it has to be the tallest ever. And they're like, oh my God, we never thought of that. You're, you're, you're genius. It's my like, God, he, he, who would have thought of this? Only you. Um, you know, Madeleine Albright, there's another, there's another fun, I, I, I thought that the, you know, as they're interacting more with the outside world, I thought the propaganda was getting more rational, but it's actually getting as insane. And here's, Madeleine Albright goes to visit very famously in uh, 2000. Now remember, the U.S. policy is we do not negotiate with terrorists, yet of course, you know, 13, 12 years prior to that, Kim Jong-il blew up a plane, she goes there, she shakes his hand, and if you read the books in North Korea, Madeleine Albright shows up, she's got an American brooch, but as she was leaving, the brooch was changed to that of a cowboy, which is apparently the international symbol of friendship, because she was so impressed by Kim Jong-il. Now, why she would have that brooch with her at all, I don't really know, but that's how the stories go. Wherever he goes, you know, the weather changes. But these stories that we hear about with the golf and, and the miracles, it's, the focus is not on Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung or Supernatural. It's very much on the fact that they're superhuman, that they are the best at everything. There's that blog that some of you know, Kim Jong-il looking at things. But there, there's a purpose to that. The idea is they know things aren't great, but this guy is going to every factory, every town. He's not in some ivory tower. You know, he shows up and he goes, you know what, cornstarch factory, you guys should make more cornstarch. And they're like, oh my God, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> can you believe this guy? So it's kind of to give the, the people this idea that they're being taken care of and so on and so forth. Now, here's the good thing about the famine. When you, it's true, when you can't feed even the army, it's very, very hard to enforce social control and obedience. So that big border between a Korea, North Korea and China, it's a river, the Tumen River, became very porous because you'd have that guard there, but that guard is just as hungry as everybody else, and if you bribe him, he will let you go to China. And there's a very famous and really effed up story in this wonderful book called The, the Hidden People of North Korea, where this middle-aged woman, her daughter, escapes, right? And she knows, I have to escape now or else I'm gonna go to the camp to get punished for my daughter. So she bribes the guard, she has nothing. She's wandering around the Chinese countryside in a nightgown, like, what the hell do I do now? Wandering, wandering, she comes across a farm and there's a bowl with meat and rice in it. And she hadn't even seen meat in years. And she's like, why is this rice and meat on the floor? And then she hears a dog barking and she realizes that the dogs in China eat better than the people in North Korea in some areas. Uh, I mean, it got to the point they're eating grass roots, they're eating bark. Uh, things just to keep you full with no nutritional value. And Kim jo this is during the 90s, Kim Jong-il launched a campaign called Let's Eat Two Meals a Day Instead of Three, because three meals a day make you fat. Look at those disgusting Americans. This is actually better that we don't have food. <laughs> it's funny, but I mean, I mean it, it's, it's also you know, how, how messed up it is. North Koreans are, even though they're genetically identical, obviously the South Koreans are on average four inches shorter. Um, there's also, you know, when you grow up malnourished, there's problems with like mental retardation happening. Uh, and, and one of the sickest aspects of North Korea, uh, they have something called the Kachebi, which are the little street orphans whose parents either abandoned them or whose parents died. And they're called Kachebi, which is Korean for little sparrow, because they have little bodies and big heads because they don't grow, and they bounce around the countryside looking for food in the dirt. And I asked this, you know, refugee person, I'm like, did your heart not kind of break for seeing these kids? And she goes, when you're hungry, they're a nuisance. Like when you are starving, all you're thinking about is food. You're not thinking about some poor kid. You're thinking about your next meal. And there's something to be said for that. You know, I'm from New York, and when we see homeless people, they're not children, but when we see them, you don't acknowledge them. You find them to be kind of a nuisance. And that was kind of an eye-opening thing for her to tell me. What else was funny is she really likes the Hunger Games. 
Um, so there's that dark sense of humor which Russians and, and, and they share. And a friend of mine, uh, Peter, he pointed out, if you look at the photos, it just looks like, like Leningrad, you know, Pyongyang, except there's Asian people there um, instead of white people. Um, they do definitely have nukes, you know, a lot of the money went, went towards nukes. The question is, you know, can they deliver them? Probably not. Uh, I mean, certainly not. I mean, these, if you go to Pyongyang at night, there's like very little electricity and there's nothing more eerie. It's, I, I can't even describe it when you're in like a major metropolis of two million people and there's no street lights, but there's people walking around, you know, and having kind of fun. Um, let me see how much time I have. Okay. Um, you know, Kim, and so now, where is North Korea now? There's been a lot, a lot of change. And there's not change at the state level, and there can't be change at the state level, and here's why. In 1989 or 91, I don't remember, in Romania, Ceausescu was a dictator very much like Kim Il-sung, and within a day, he was overthrown, and him and his wife were shot and assassinated on the street. And Kim Jong-il played this footage to all the people in North Korean government, said, this is going to be you. If there is any kind of liberalization, we've been, I mean, they've been lying to these people for 70 years, uh, and they've been putting relatives and friends into camps for 70 years. You're telling me that there's not going to be someone who wants to put a bullet in these people, and with good reason? So they're not in a position to liberalize. I mean, the, the, it's a lot easier to tell a small lie then a, they've been building uh, on these lies for decades, so even a little bit of information undermines the whole thing. I mean, uh, I, they don't t teach them about Hiroshima because that puts the U.S. as the Japanese enemy. They don't teach them about the Holocaust. Um, they only teach them about, you know, Korea. So as soon as they have any information, and especially the big myth, because Kim Il-sung started the Korean War, but they tell them that the U.S. started the Korean War, and at any minute, as soon as they let down the guard, the U.S. are going to come in and kill everybody. You know, when these refugees find out that Kim Il-sung started the Korean War, it's kind of like saying FDR started Pearl Harbor against the Japanese. It just, you can't even, it doesn't make sense with what you've been taught and everything that's been built on it. Um, but they've been getting a lot of information from South Korean soap operas. North Korea is, one the, is the world's pretty much biggest uh, consumer of VCRs now because no one else wants them. And they're seeing how, the, you know, in these trashy shows, how these poor South Korean people are, which is not propaganda, obviously, these poor South Korean people are living, and they're like, I don't know anyone, you know, who lives like this. So, and the, again, the border with China is so porous. They sell them ginseng, and the Chinese give them food. You know, people go to China all the time. And in fact, if you're caught crossing the border for China just for food purposes, they'll put you in the camp, but like for like a week. And it's like, yeah, don't do it again. If you're bringing back like Bibles or you're undermining the state, that's when it's a real problem. Um, so the people are really wise to what's going on, uh, especially in, in Pyongyang, which regards itself as very cosmopolitan. Uh, it's, it's kind of a big honor to be able to step foot in Pyongyang. So a lot of this propaganda is, is directed by the government towards the people, of course, but a lot of their propaganda is, di is directed toward us because they want us to see them as this one military unit. These people are ready to fight the Americans at the drop of a hat, but these people have had it, uh, and they are not buying into the hype you know, uh, that much any longer. So I just wanted to leave some time for questions. I'm sure you people have a lot, so let's just do that. Yes, oh, thank you. Oh wait, just, so, just one more thing. You know, I, again, I'm writing the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. It'll come out in October. If you want to follow it, just go to kimjongilbook.com or you can follow me on Facebook, Michael Malice. Uh, yes. Oh, we need to get you a mic. Oh, can, we, can everyone asking questions come up to the mic, please? So we could get it on the video. Yes. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on Dennis Rodman being a diplomat and doing more for North Korea-U.S. relations than Barack Hussein Obama. Dennis Rodman should have a bullet put in his head. I, I will tell you, I could not be a lesser fan of this president. It's not possible. But for him to publicly challenge Obama and say, Kim Jong-un is waiting for your call, I saw him on the Apprentice finale saying, Kim Jong-un's a good guy to me. 
uh, what you're going to call someone who takes children and puts them in labor camps as a good guy uh, and, and spread that, that is just absolutely disgusting. And one of the things I'm trying to do with this book and, and talks like this in general is people all, the line I always use is, is it's like the Joker, right? Everyone's focusing on this clown, but there's all these bodies behind him as well. And the more the focus is on North Korean wackiness and the less it is on the brutality the fact that you've got, you know, a nation of 24 million people living in constant fear and constant hunger. Um, you know, w when these people become free, they're still screwed because they're completely uneducated. You know, refugees, when they go to South Korea, they don't understand what an ATM is. These people don't have computers. Um, so it's very, very going to be a very dark and, and difficult transition. And any kind of thing, you know, they're very much Kim Jong-un in every photo is smiling, right? He's a happy guy, but it's just like this is easily you know the the most you know uh oppressive regime on earth so any kind of you know impression that mitigates that i think is really kind of this uh like the people who were apologists for stalinist back in the day stalinism excuse me yes oh forgive me i may have the wrong korea here but i remember seeing somewhere of, of uh, uh well hold on look at my shirt korea's one remember no, no yeah you're right yeah <laughs> uh the, the blow up uh the blow up inflatable police officer on the street corner or something did you ever see that there's a blow they, like there there were some uh, some they, there were blow up happy police officers on the streets so in one of the Koreas. Did you, I, I don't think that's you North Korea. In North Korea, it, uh, you have on the street corners the traffic girls where they're picked by their beauty and they always turn the quarter, you know, and, and they guide traffic that isn't there. They spend all day, it's like this, you know, and then they turn. Um, but now they've been replaced by traffic lights. They have a little bit more electricity. But I've, they don't have blow up anything because that, that's technology, that, that's plastics that they don't have. <laughs> The program was, it just showed, uh, it was like a propaganda program to make, make everybody happy about the police officers, and, and there, were, there were these the, blow-up inflatable... Uh, it must be South Korea, and here's why, because the police are not a strong presence in North Korea, it's the military. Uh, one out of four people are in the military, and what's really insane is the military isn't just sitting around waiting for war, they do all the construction um, as well. Uh, so you'll always, and they don't have like, 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 a, like, steam shovels or whatever, so they're doing it by hand. So the buildings are all crappy and they take very long. Um, but they're, they're actually putting them to work. Yes? I was wondering if you could speak on the propaganda about the U.S. and what we're going through and how they see, uh, you know, the, the economic downturn and, and all of that. Yeah, just two days ago, North Korea posted an article attacking us for this NSA stuff. They said, how dare the U.S attack North, uh, use the term human rights when they have a surveillance state and, and it's a nation only where the richest, rich people's rights are protected. So the propaganda against the U.S., again, it's kind of this fascist thing. They describe us as all having hook noses and pot bellies. And there's this very funny story where this fat North Korean official went to visit a school and all the kindergartners attacked him because they saw the pot belly. He must be an evil American. And, and in fact, the kids at night go through the school looking for American spies, you know, and they, of course, never find anything, but they have this idea in their head, which is not far off from the truth that as soon as they let their guard down, we're going to come and take over because, you know, President Bush, when he says axis of evil, that's kind of like a kill list, you know. It, he, there, we've certainly been pu very publicly discussing going in there for a very long time, so their whole mentality, and, and the famine, of course, was all our fault uh, because of our sanctions, uh, and we want them to starve as a mechanism of forcing them to change the regime. Uh, and in fact, you know, all these U NGOs went in there to try to give the people food, and they were only allowed to see specific towns, um, and they kind of all left. And what's, what's even more insane and evil is, you know, Shangban, based on your caste system and your family background, the food went to the towns with the people who had good family background. So the regions where the people had a bad family background were the first to starve. And Kim Jong Il's like, eh, they're class enemies anyway, so, you know, it, it might be for the best. So it, it's, it's, it's really, really dark stuff. Yes. So every once in a while in the news, it, it blows up about North Korea having nukes and how they're going to nuke us. And then there's talks that happen, and they promise to shut down a reactor if we give them food or whatnot. And that seems to happen like every year, every other year. Yep. Um, and also, too, with, there's like a factory, I think, somewhere near the border that a lot of uh, South Koreans yep. go to the north to work in. Um, I, I know from alternate history I've read online about World War II, how there was a lot of American companies that supported the Nazis and American banks sure. that actually did business. Do you think it's 
from what you've seen? Do you think it's very possible that our government actually does support the North Korean government by constantly giving them the food and, well, and with the whole banking system way it's set up? That's a great question. Th that reminds me of a very good anecdote. Towards the end of Kim Jong-il, this is how bad they are with economics because they're only learning Juche economics, which, which means everything's great in North Korea, right? So towards the end of Kim Jong-il's life, he raised wages 10,000%. Right? So if I'm earning $30, 31 a month, now I'm earning like 3,000 won a month. And they were baffled that inflation immediately took over and prices went up 3,000%. And they shot the agricultural minister because his, he undermined this. Uh, th that is how far removed they are from any semblance of economic understanding. Uh, and and it, it's, this, it's this whole idea of, you know, Everything's going to work, we just have to work harder, which kind of Mao had during a bit during the Cultural Revolution, and there's no feedback for them to kind of improve. Now, is the U.S. government helping them? I would bet absolutely not, if only because they're so homogenous. It, you know, U.S. people would, would stand out a lot, and they rather had the people starve than to hand out bags of rice that had the U.S. flag on them. Um, so, if, and if the U.S. was helping them, they'd be, I think, a lot better off. I know that they made moves to the U.S. to try to, you know, we did bribe them to shut down these reactors, and they've got a lot of infrastructure that's underground, literally underground. Uh, they have these huge tunnels to go to South Korea. Um, but again, it's very easy to say, to, one thing to have a nuke, it's nothing to have a nuke that can reach California. You know, their trains aren't working. So, and, and this idea that they're going to nuke Seoul, again, Korea's one. If you go anywhere in North Korea, the map of, of Korea will be both countries as one country. So these are their brothers in their perspective, and they, they, it, it's very, very unlikely that they would nuke Seoul. It's like us nuking Ottawa, as opposed to maybe Mexico City. Yes. But, I mean, that's how they look at it. Uh, two questions. The first one, you said that uh, North Korea was doing all right for a while, like they had some industrialization. Right. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how that broke down into having no electricity and also sure. you said Americans kind of stick out what was it like sticking okay. out uh, 1990 what happened why why all the industrialization failed 1991 the Soviet Union fell apart the so they were, North Korea was a welfare state in that the state was getting welfare from the Soviet Union and China and come the collapse of the Soviet Union they're like you're on your own buddy and it's like oh oh what self-reliance hey uh, we can make gasoline out of mountainside somehow no oh look so, and it's literally like Atlas Shrugged in the sense that you'd have food in one region and you'd have like cotton in another and there's no gasoline, so the trains couldn't bring the food from this region to another. And it's just sitting there rotting. It's just, it's that level. So it's very much, uh, you know, a, a function of the Soviet Union falling apart. Number one, what it's like to, if anyone is at all considering going there, go. It's not going to be like this for much longer. I could have killed someone literally and I would have been deported instead of sent to jail because you're there under the auspices of the state. Every aspect of that country is interesting because every aspect has been consciously chosen and removed from the rest of the earth for 70 years. And the people are extremely friendly. Being an American, and I know how people perceive Americans, I got in everyone's face because they're going to expect me to be obnoxious anyway, right? But their reactions are going to be sincere. When you wave at a little grandkid and the grandma is all glo you know, doting over her or teenage girls you know, giggle, you know, this is not a nation of the best improv actors on earth. These are human beings, you know, who are kind of suffering. Yes. Uh, how does North Korea um, justify the ideas of self-reliance with the kind of necessary cooperative ethos that a communism would require? I mean, how do these things jive culturally? Uh, they, so North Korea no longer identifies itself as communism and hasn't for a while. They changed their constitution to say um, uh, 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 military first. Um, Sean Gunn, um, they regard Juche as an improvement over Marxist-Leninism and they're applying communism to the North Korean situation and North Korea is unique because it's been its own country for 5,000 years, we have a pure blood for 5,000 years, so what might work for Eastern Europe where there's mongrel races does not apply to us which are the purest and there's a very good book called The Cleanest Race by Myers which I highly recommend and it just talks about how this, they have this very much pure blood fascist mentality. So it, they're like, yeah, that's great for you, we don't care about you, we care about us and this works for us. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the American defectors that are still there and some of them that have come back? So there were four soldiers who crossed the DMZ, the border, the very heavily militarized border between North and South Korea because they, they didn't want to be in the army and they were like, screw this. They go to North Korea. North Korea didn't really know what to do with them. One of them escaped 
and I read his book, and he referred to North, he said, this is the quote, he goes, I didn't realize that the nation I was defecting to is literally a giant demented prison. <laughs> so all four of them were very like uneducated. They're like, why am I in South Korea fighting? I don't want to fight. Like the, in 1950s and early 60s when the propaganda was going on, North Korea wasn't a worse place necessarily than South Korea. But then when they're there, they couldn't leave and then they had to all be actors and they all had to be English teachers because no one else in the whole country spoke English or looked white. Um, so any movie where you have a kind of a, a, an American, they had, they're the ones playing them. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Beside me, the rain can't reach us here, it's safe and dry. The silence is a season, all its own this morning. 